First off, thanks everybody for coming to the uh, morning seminar. For those of you that this is an early rise for, or if you've driven in from afar, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Albert Birchtold. I work at Performance Designs in Deland, Florida. Uh, I've been over here to the AGM a couple times. Uh, I missed last year. I was here the year prior and then a few years before that as well. Uh, I work at Performance Designs. Uh, I'm the marketing manager there. I've been employed at PD for about 12 years now. Uh, skydive as much as I can. I compete regularly in canopy piloting. Uh, I've also competed in canopy formation, uh, classic accuracy. I've done a lot of video for four-way, big-way stuff, so a little bit of everything. Um, mostly driven by the canopy-related events. That's why I work at a parachute manufacturer. That's kind of been my drive. So. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, selecting a canopy and how you may go about doing that. So whether you're somebody who is new in the sport and you're looking to select a canopy yourself or you're, or you're, uh, or you're an instructor and you're giving advice to people on a regular basis, uh, whichever person you may be at one end of the spectrum or the other, this some of this information may help you in, in either guiding yourself to a canopy choice or helping someone else uh, in selecting a canopy. So some of the stuff we're going to talk about here isn't, uh, isn't groundbreaking. They're probably all concepts and ideas that you've considered before, but I've just tried to put them together into, into uh, some cohesive ideas and thoughts and ways you may want to go about thinking of things. So first we're going to talk a little bit about, um, about canopies. So uh, there's a lot of different models of canopies out there from various manufacturers. And within each manufacturer, you'll find in some, with some companies a dozen, different, a dozen or more different models to choose from. And it can, be a pretty, it can be a pretty daunting task to try and sift through the, all of the various information that's out there and make the best decision for you or, or help in helping a student make one. So um, you've got to kind of look through all that. First off, who in the room has who in the room has less than a hundred jumps? Okay. A few. Who has between a hundred and five hundred? Okay. Who has over a five hundred? Okay. So it's a pretty even mix. We've got people here that are relatively new. We've got some people that are of a middle experience level jump wise and then we've got some people that have obviously been in the sport for some time. So whether you're at one end of the spectrum or the other you, you might take some of this information differently. Um, so <clears throat> obviously there's a lot of different canopies out there. Um, the evolution of the sport has changed. Um, where we've come in the sport of skydiving is a long way. Uh, in the United States, USPA is actually um, celebrating the centennial of the first free fall skydive, which happened 100 years ago this year. So it's a pretty big milestone. And from that first skydive that happened, intentional free fall skydive that happened, um, we've come a long way. The sport has changed. What we do in the sport, the evolution of the sport has changed. You know, the idea that we'd be going across the ground at 100 plus miles an hour with a parachute probably was never in consideration 100 years ago when that first person jumped out of an aircraft with the intention of making a free fall jump with, a, with something that holds no resemblance to what we skydive with today, any of the equipment. So the sport has evolved. Um, there's been a lot of changes based on the market. You know, what do we want as skydivers uh, from our parachutes and from parachute manufacturing? So a lot of those changes have been uh, market driven and the different types of parachutes we have are driven by what the market desires, what the community desires. Uh, technology changes. So different things have become available to us in the sport. Uh, there's been different airfoils and plan forms through research and development. Uh, new fabrics have evolved. Uh, you look at silk fabric, you look at non-coated F111 type material, you look at zero porosity type fabric and sail fabric and you name it, there's a million of them out there now. So they're all a little bit different and they've, they've changed uh, the way we have w the parachutes we have to use. The lines we use have, have advanced drastically uh, over, 
over the last hundred years. And the deployment systems, how we get from being in free fall to being under an uh, inflated parachute that's going to descend us to the ground safely. There's been major changes in the way, uh, in the way those systems work. So why are there so many different canopies? <clears throat> so for this, for the purpose of this seminar, I've broken it down into two, two basic things. And one is that there's different uses of the parachutes we have, and there are different users. So that idea might seem pretty, pretty reasonable, pretty simple. We're going to get into those two, two sides a little bit more. We're going to talk a little bit about the different uses uh, in the sport. So there's different types of skydiving, right? This is not not groundbreaking, right? That we have formation skydiving, we have big ways, we have wingsuiting, we have canopy piloting, we have canopy formation, we've got video or instructors out there that are working in the sport. Uh, we have XRW now, which is something that's come along in the last few years that's uh, people actually have parachutes designed around that now. So uh, these types of different uses are driving the different types of canopies that we have available to us. Uh, what do you want from your canopy? You know, what's your desire? What do you want it to do? You know, everybody feels differently about that. What do you want from your skydiving career? Uh, everybody has different goals. Some people are just looking to get from the end of their free fall jump to the ground. Other people have different, uh, different drives. They want to go compete and be a world champion in canopy formation. They're going to be driven to use different types of parachutes, different technologies that are available to them. And uh, what is your level of risk assumption? So we're going to come across this uh, a couple times, which is, you know, obviously uh, with the different parachutes you choose, you have a different level of risk assumption. Obviously, you jump a Navigator 260 on your first skydive. That has a certain level of risk assumption based on your skill level. And as you change parachute sizes and design, uh, that risk profile changes, and it's different for every person. So consider that. Uh, and be honest with yourself. With all these questions, as you answer them in your own head, be honest with yourself about, about these different uses and what you truly intend to use the parachute for. Um, you, you'll run into people all the time who, who buy something, and then they, they, you find out what they w really want to do. They may have bought something for some reason based on some other influence. But then when it comes around to what they're actually planning on, the types of skydiving they're doing, their level of risk assumption, and where they want to go in the sport, the, the decision they made doesn't necessarily tie to that. So be honest with yourself and, and make the right choices because it's, it's, uh, it's your, your time in the sport that will, uh, that will suffer if you're not honest with yourself about it. On the other side of that, we have uh, different users. Everybody has different experience and different preferences. The obvious one that most people go to first off is jump numbers. Um, how many jumps do you have? How much do you weigh? What's your build like? And these are, these are important, important things to consider, but they're not the end-all, be-all of what you should jump. It's not a simple formula where you say, OK, you weigh this many, uh, this many pounds or this many kilos, and uh, you're this tall and you have this many jump numbers, so you get a Sabre 2170. There you go. Have a nice day. Off, off, off you go. There's a lot more you need to take into consideration. Uh, canopy progression. <coughs> what size and model uh, has the person, have you or has the person you're instructing uh, jumped before? What sizes have they jumped? What sort of time have they spent on them? How many jumps have they put on each of those canopies? Personal advancement through education and canopy coaching. <clears throat> many, many years ago, the idea of going to someone who is a professional canopy coach was, was unheard of. You know, We're all skydivers. We're all type A personalities. And 30 years ago, that was no different. Um, if you had a parachute and you put it on and you jumped it and you didn't land well, well, obviously, there was something wrong with that parachute because it, there's no way it could have been anything that you did that that made you pound into the ground. It was obviously a fault in design of the canopy somehow. But we've come a long way in the sport, and we've realized that this is a sport like any other that requires training. It requires, it requires learning. And it's, it's amazing, that, and it's, it's wonderful that people in our sport have become open to that idea 
and understand that we can all learn and we can all become better at this at this thing we do, which is a sport. And everybody is a little bit different there. Some people have never taken a canopy course and they do perfectly wonderfully and other people do horrible. And some people have gone through and taken a series of courses with a, a, um, a very skilled, uh, skilled instructor or s skilled series of instructors from a school and they've got a, a higher level of skill there. Uh, we all have a different frame of reference. So we all feel differently about things. What's hard to one person isn't hard to another when it comes to deployments. What's a fast parachute and what's a slow parachute is different from one person to the next. Um, we have uh, customers who, uh, Chris Gay, he's the, uh, one of the members of the US Canopy Formation team. Uh, he was involved in the engineering of the 100-way diamond, which is the Canopy Formation world record. Uh, he will regularly jump a lightning uh, at terminal with a mesh slider on it, and he doesn't see any problem with that at all. He thinks it opens wonderfully, and he doesn't understand why everybody doesn't do that. Well, I would reckon that probably 99% of you in this room um, would feel that that's completely unreasonable for you to do, uh, self-included. Like, I wouldn't do that. It's, they open quite briskly, and it, it would hurt most of us. Uh, so that's a frame of reference. We all feel differently about that kind of thing. I know people who, if you regularly jump a 190 and you put on a 170 or 150 square foot parachute, that thing's going to seem lightning fast to you. We have customers who call us who are interested in trying out or jumping a Silhouette 260 and they want to try out a 230 and they put it on and they jump it and they just can't believe how anyone would jump a parachute that's that fast. Where if you handed that same parachute to somebody who regularly jumps something that's under 100 square feet, they're going to have a very different... Um, feeling about that parachute so we're all a little we're all different users in that respect um, what is performance so is there anybody here who has ever desired to get a canopy that performs worse than the one you have now anybody ever say I'm thinking about buying your parachute and you, you talk to your instructor and you say I really want one that just this one works great but I'd love one that doesn't perform near as well but nobody does that right but what is performance to you? Some people, performance is the ability to get back from a long spot after doing a video jump or doing an AFF jump. Some people, performance is the ability to pull down on a front riser and make the canopy go fast and swoop across the ground. Some people, it's just getting back from a good spot, having a nice soft touchdown landing that they don't have to run on, and the canopy is very docile. So all three of those people are looking for something different but they all use the same word to describe it. They all want performance. But what does that word mean to you? And that's really the essence of kind of what you need to get to as far as being a different user. Um, we all have physical limitations. We all, some of us have past injuries. Uh, some people have broken ankles, rolled ankles, hurt backs, necks, things like that. Whether it be in the sport of skydiving or in some other activity that we've done in our life. Maybe we had a car accident, whatever it may be. Uh, some of us have past, past uh, injuries or physical limitations, and we need to be uh, realistic in looking at those at, and see, uh, see where we're at personally with that. Ability and desire to run. Uh, if you're in that position where you're getting to a point and you say, you know what, I'm just tired of running out landings, <clears throat> and you want a new parachute that you don't have to run as much with, well, there's, it's, that's, that's a reasonable request, and in some cases that can be fulfilled by changing the parachute you're jumping. In some cases it can be fulfilled by doing something we talked about earlier with you know, personal advancement through education and coaching. But in most cases we have people come across and say, I don't want to run anymore. I've got a Stiletto 135, so I'm thinking about getting a Stiletto 120. The obvious answer, if you don't want to run anymore, is buy a parachute. The easy answer is buy a parachute one size bigger than the one you have now. You know, um, you jump a Stiletto 135 and you love everything about it. You love the way it opens. You love the way it flies. You love the way it responds on toggles. You love the way it lands, but it's just a little bit too much for you, maybe a little too fast. Buy a Stiletto 150. You know, if you really like the design and you like everything it does, you just wish it did it all a little bit slower, change the size up one. It's pretty simple. 
So think about that. And the last thing, we'll come to this again, be honest with yourself. Um, we're all type A personalities. But that's the, the type of person that's driven into the sport. But uh, think about the different things here and be honest with who you are. You know, if you have a physical limitation that keeps you from doing certain things, don't buy a parachute that exceeds that, that physical ability or limitation that you have. If you are of a certain size, be honest with yourself on it, you know. Um, any questions on that stuff so far? Cool. We're going to shift here a little bit on the how to evaluate a canopy. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the things you may uh, consider when, you know, either evaluating a canopy for your own purchase or assisting someone else. So obviously you're going to look at the size of the canopy. Uh, is it bigger or smaller than what you have now? Uh, look at the openings, the deployment. So uh, at PD, when we do research and development test jumps, we break the opening down into three individual parts. The snatch, which is obviously the, is the canopy coming out of the bag and what that feels like. The snivel, which is the canopy is open. You're at full line extension. The slider is all the way up. And the canopy sniveling. What does that feel like? And the inflation which is typically seen as the slider coming down and the canopy inflating through the cross ports. So each one of those parts of the deployment are going to feel a little bit different. With each model you jump, with each size you jump, how fast you're going, are you terminal, are you subterminal, did you slow down before the deployment, did you stop tracking, how did you pack, all those things are going to weigh into that, but how does that feel to you? Uh, understanding hard versus soft opening as well as altitude loss so one of the great things in the sport <coughs> that's come around more recently is that we've always thought of as an opening as either hard or soft and we've equated the altitude loss equally with those two words if an opening was harder well then it was obviously faster and if an opening was softer then it obviously took longer that's not always the case so in development of a canopy, you can have a canopy that opens soft and exerts very little force on the body, but does not take a lot of altitude to open. So those things don't have to exist together. They can be separate. So consider, consider the way those things are and know that just because something is hard or feels brisk or one part of, those, one part of that deployment, the inflation maybe is harder uh, than another canopy doesn't mean that it actually took less altitude and vice versa. Just because something doesn't necessarily hurt, you throw the pilot chute out and it snivels, opens up quickly, and you're like, "Wow, I'm under the canopy." The opening felt very comfortable, but it didn't, and it didn't use a lot of altitude either. So, um, different designs do that differently. Uh, the Pulse is a good example of one that uh, opens up very soft, exerts very little force on the body but actually opens quicker than a lot of its a lot of other canopies that are available out there. Uh, flight. <clears throat> Look at the flight of the canopy and, and evaluate that. How does the canopy feel in full flight? How does it react to turns with the toggles? How does it react to <coughs> rear riser inputs, front riser inputs? And what does the stall characteristics feel like of the canopy? Um, they're all going to be a little bit different. Um, uh, do you want? Are you looking for something that's steep, or are you looking for something that's flatter? Um, how does the canopy perform? What are the stall characteristics like? Does it feel like it's higher? Does it seem like you're reaching that stall point? You know, when you're at the bottom of your rib cage, or is it full arm extension with your hands turned over sideways and your shoulders pushed down? What does it take to reach that point? Um, every canopy is a little bit different. Some of them it's a little bit higher on. Some of them it's a little bit lower on. Some of them, that stall point comes on, and you can slowly feel the canopy start to fold behind you. And some canopies, that stall is a little bit more abrupt and a little bit harder to s feel coming on. So evaluate what that feels like and if it's something uh, that's, that's what you're looking for. Uh, landing. So I kind of simplified this to, you know, you have some canopies that are a bit steeper, and you have some canopies that are a bit flatter. Um, uh, 
some canopies come in, they have a very dynamic, and we'll tie steep to dynamic, meaning <coughs> comes in with a bit more speed, and as you start to pull down on the toggles, that pitch into level flight is quite a bit more pronounced, kind of cruises across the ground, and as you finish off your flare, it stops. Other canopies that might be a bit flatter, you're still going through the same flight cycle, but you'll notice that as you pitch that canopy into level flight, Maybe it's a bit less of that swoop portion of the landing and kind of stops, feels more like what some people might refer to as like a one stage type landing where it's a more fluid motion of the hands, comes down, still goes through all those same points in the flight cycle, but um, feels a little bit different. What is the toggle stroke like? Um, as you start pulling down the toggles, does it feel like you've got a bit of slack in the beginning or do you start immediately getting responses? Every parachute's gonna be a little bit different in that respect. Um, there are some canopies out there that, like a stiletto, has a much shorter control range. As you start flaring, and then you continue flaring, you get down to about mid-range to your belly button, and you're, you're kind of, you're probably finished landing, you know, you finish it off and you're done. Other canopies, like, say, a storm, um, as you come in to land there, the range that that toggle stroke has is a lot longer. You'll find a lot more of the power on the flare on that canopy for landing at the very bottom of your arm extension. So. Every parachute's a little bit different in that way. And they all have pros and cons, but you're going to want to consider all that. Uh, so let's look at a few of those things and compare two, two canopies. So <clears throat> I pulled flight characteristics of the, the Pulse and the Sabre II. So deployments. The pulse uses a bit less altitude uh, through the opening sequence. Uh, requires a bit less discipline to keep the canopy on heading. It's pretty resistant to, uh, to pulling off heading on openings. Where the Sabre 2 would use a bit more altitude uh, on opening than the, than the pulse does. Uh, and it demands a bit more discipline in the harness. So it takes a bit longer to open, more susceptible if you're leaning in the harness. It's going to go one way or the other. These are two beginner to intermediate type canopies. They can be jumped at higher wing loadings, like the smaller Sabre 2s are pretty advanced wings. But this is a common decision that, that uh, somebody who's looking at buying their first or second canopy may be making. Pulse, the uh, flight characteristics of that canopy. In flight, it's pretty flat. Uh, the, you'll notice that the toggle input, you're going to get a bit more input earlier on bit snappier side-to-side -side type turns is how I describe them. Um, and it's not designed for extensive front riser maneuvering. The front risers on it are going to seem pretty heavy. Where the Sabre 2 is kind of the opposite side of that. Uh, it has a very wide speed range. So in full flight, um, it's really steep canopy. But when you go into deep brakes, it'll float quite a bit. So the range of speeds you'll get out of that wing is, is quite a bit uh, wider. Uh, it's designed more for front riser maneuver, so it's going to have lighter front riser pressure. Uh, and when you do turns with it, it's going to have a longer diving type turn. It's going to take a bit longer to recover from a turn or from a dive. So these are both nine cell canopies. They're both thought of as semi-elliptical wings in the, in the skydiving community. But as you can see, they've got vastly different characteristics in the way they fly. Uh, the pulse is a rather easy to flare timing. Um, it comes in pretty flat, gives you lots of time to watch the ground as it comes up. And if you've got an issue with depth perception or speed on landing, this is a, a really um, reasonable option for you. Uh, Sabre 2 has a bit more of that dynamic flare. Comes in a bit faster with that steeper glide and full flight. And then you're gonna have a lot of power to plane that canopy out cruise across the ground, depending on the size and wing loading you're at, and then stop. So uh, one's a bit easier on the timing. The other is a bit more dynamic on the landing. Sizes, pretty comparable. They both go up to a 260, down to a 107 for the Pulse and a 97 for the Sabre 2. So that's kind of an example of how you, you can look at two canopies that, you know, if you just say, well, I'm looking for a 9-cell that's semi-elliptical, those are two parachutes that are nine cell semi-elliptical. And if that's the only criteria you put on a wing selection, then you're, you, if you pick the incorrect one for who you are as a user, 
you're probably going to be disappointed. So putting the time into researching the, the different options that are out there and, and looking at who you are and what you want is important. So let's talk a little bit about if, um, if you're a, one of those people who's you're helping out a fellow jumper or a student and um, what are some things you can uh, do to help someone decide a wing. So first off, think about the stuff we just talked about and uh, ask questions and listen to them. There's a lot of things that people will say uh, in discussing parachutes and, and their skydiving career that will answer a lot of those questions that you just came across as far as who someone is. This is a lot of the information that <coughs> we use when someone calls us to ask for a demo canopy or we have tours that are out uh, around the United States and around Europe who go out and, and talk to people about what they want, what kind of parachutes they're jumping, what they're looking for. So one of the first things that we'll do in having a conversation with them is get to know who they are, what they're doing, what they want, you know, what they want and what they don't want. So, I mean, obviously getting a good idea of the skill level, the number of jumps a person has, their time in the sport is important. Um, all good things to evaluate when uh, helping someone decide a canopy. What sort of experience they have. Um, look at canopy progression. We talked about that. What have they jumped before? How many jumps do they have on that parachute? Um, not everyone who has 500 jumps may be jumping the same size canopy at the same wing loading. What was the person jumping before? There's people that come out of the military who may have 500 jumps doing static line round jumps. Well, that's 500 jumps, but it's not necessarily going to provide the same background and history and canopy choice as someone who has 500 jumps on ram air parachutes and has sl slowly stepped down over time. Uh, what does the person jump now? <coughs> and what do they like or dislike about that canopy? So we talked about the guy who has a Stiletto 135 and loves it but just wants something a little bit bigger. If you like what you're jumping now but you're looking for something either smaller or larger, then consider that same model in a smaller or larger size. Uh, what type of jumping do you do? Is the model you've chosen a good selection for the type of skydiving you're doing? If you're looking at getting into big way formation skydiving, then picking up something that takes a really long time to open, you know, if you may be opening at lower altitudes if you're in the base of a large formation, picking a canopy that takes a really long time to open and is susceptible to loss of heading control on deployment might not be the best choice for you. That's why you don't see many people on those big ways jumping uh, cross brace wings. It's just they're not the right tool for the job. You know, I know a lot of people who jump velocities um, for their fun jumping, but then when they go on the big way, they pick up a storm or a pulse, and they've got that available to put in their rig um, in place of their, their cross brace canopy. Uh, what are your goals in the sport, and what do you want from your next canopy? So downsizing in the sport has become something that's a little bit too trendy, in my opinion. Um, what do you want from the next wing you have? Do you really want a smaller wing? Do you really want to go faster? Or, do you, or maybe is the wing you have just a good idea for what, for what you are and who you are and what you're planning to do in the sport? So consider what you really want. Uh, and what your customer really wants or the, the student you're talking to. And it comes back to the original things we talked about. Try to get a better understanding of the desired use and the user that you're talking to. So who is that student of yours? It's, it's not just a person with, you know, it's not just a skydiver with 50 jumps and they get this parachute. They're, they're an individual, they're a special person. You know, I don't want to say we're all, we're all special. But, you know, we are. We're all different, right? We all want different things out of the sport. And the nice thing is we can have that. We can all have different parachutes that do different things. So now let's switch over to the other side. As a customer, <coughs> there are various areas and various ways for you to get advice. 
And you need to vet all that advice. Where does it come from? Manufacturers in today's day and age are very accessible. You can call most of them up. You can send them an email and they'll most, most of them will reply. You can find them on Facebook. Uh, half of them will show up at your DZ with a bunch of parachutes and let you jump them. You know, they're very accessible. So get information from them. They're, one of the, <coughs> they're a very good resource for you to gather information. Your local dealer usually has a good amount of information on various products. If you have one local at your drop zone, your instructors are a good resource of information. Riggers, friends, uh, forums online. Uh, take it all in. You know, get information from everywhere you can and gather it all in. Don't just simply talk to one person and go, okay, that's, that's what I want. Um, you obviously have different sources, but which one of those is right? Because you're going to get varying information from everyone you go talk to. Um, so develop within your, for your own personal situation, develop a hierarchy of credibility within those sources and look at them and say, you know, which one of these do I believe? Which one of them is, seems like it has more valuable advice than another one? Um, you know, if you're talking to someone from a, a, a dealership or a rigger or a manufacturer, you know, look, are they simply just trying to sell you a specific item that they have for sale? Or are they listening to you and, and trying to figure out what kind of user you are and trying to find the best fit for you? So um, take all that information in and, and try and make a wise decision. Next, we'll jump back over to folks that are um, giving advice. And if you're in a position, <coughs> if you've got a lot of jumps and you're thinking about you know, you're an instructor and you've got somebody coming up through the ranks and you're going to talk to them about what they might want to buy, think about jumping one of those canopies. If you have a thousand jumps and you haven't jumped a Sabre II 190 in five years, I reckon you probably really don't remember what that parachute flies like anymore. And your frame of reference is quite different now than it was, you know, five, ten years ago when you first experience that wing or a wing any wing of that size so consider consider grabbing one a local demo or uh, one from a local gear dealer or call a demo center and get one but when you do that consider the the person that you're evaluating that canopy for consider the target jumper of that wing uh, not your own personal preference so we talked about frame of reference um, if you're somebody who jumps a velocity 96 on a regular basis for your work jumps and you go jump a Sabre 2170 It's going to be slow. It's going to be slower to you, right? But the point is it how it feels to you in reference to your velocity 90 Think about the way it opens and the way it flies and the way the risers perform If you were somebody who had 50 jumps You know fly it like someone who has 50 skydives Don't go try and do a 810 degree turn to, f to find a landing and then complain that the risers are too heavy, right? Like it wasn't built to do that with, but <laughs> some guys are chuckling, but we've seen people do that. Like somebody who normally jumps a Valkyrie and they go, they jump a Sabre two and they go, man, this thing has the worst front riser pressure. Well, they're comparing the riser pressure of 170 degree, 170 square foot Sabre two to their 90 square foot Valkyrie. Well, if you do that, of course, it's going to seem like it has higher front riser pressure. But if you compare that Sabre 2 to some other canopies that are in a comparable size and wing loading, you'll find that it's actually rather light. So think about who you're trying it for and the way they're going to be flying it. Um, try and compare like to like or be cognizant of different parameters. That's what I was kind of talking about there with different sizes. So if you're going to try a 170 you're a 190 Sabre 2, and then you try a Pulse 150, you're gonna, and if you say, well, the Pulse 150 seems faster, so the Pulse is faster than the Sabre 2, or it's steeper, because the Pulse seems steeper when I jump them. Well, you jump them in two different sizes. So consider that whether you're an advice giver or you're a newer jumper making an evaluation. If you currently jump a 190, and then you jump something <coughs> in a 170, it's probably going to seem faster. Whether the design is faster or not, the canopy is probably going to seem faster because you hack 20 square feet off of it. Um, you hack just over 
ten percent off the size of the parachute. So it's gonna it's gonna do things quicker. It's probably gonna turn faster on the toggles. It's probably gonna come down quicker. That doesn't necessarily mean that that model is. So if you're in that position, try and compare like to like. Jump 190s across the board or jump 170s across the board and compare those same size for same size and that will give you a better indication of what those different models do. Uh, if you're going to try something and it's in an unfamiliar size or shape, try not to hurt yourself. And there's, there's nothing more, nothing funnier for the rest of us than watching the guy with a thousand jumps come limping back in who normally jumps a high performance Valkyrie come limping back in with a with a big gigantic saber too because he rolled his ankle on it because he didn't know how it landed. So <clears throat> try not to hurt yourself on something that's unfamiliar. Be cognizant of what it is and realize that every time you pick up a parachute that is that flies different, lands different, opens different, and is of a different size than you are comfortable with, you need to respect it. You know, you need to take the time to learn that canopy, do some practice flares with it up high and realize that it lands different than what you're used to jumping and simply going into autopilot and trying to land that parachute the same way you landed your your current canopy may not give you the best results. Uh, pitfalls in the process. Let's talk a little bit about those. Uh, Jimmy has a blah blah 190 and he loves it. So you're going to get advice from friends. Consider that Jimmy is not the same person as you. He may love his Sabre too, but that, that design may be too fast for you. It may, be, may not be what you're looking for. You may want something that's flatter like the Pulse. You know? um, so don't just accept that as gospel. Uh, make decisions off paper. We get people all the time who go, they'll call us up, they go, okay, I'm looking for something that has uh, somewhere between a 2.1 and a 2.3 aspect ratio, semi-elliptical, uh, nine cells, got to have nine cells. Uh, you're going to need Vectran lines and uh, want something that's fast but not too fast. Uh, opens really great, lands really great, goes really quick but then stops really easy uh, but also flies back from long spots with a flat glide. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Opens quick but doesn't hurt. And uh, I want it to be able to do crew as well. And I want to be able to swoop with it because I'm going to get into that one day. Well, one, you've got different things you need to choose from there, but the first part there I was getting into was don't try and make the decision off paper. Go jump it. Go jump that canopy and see what it feels like. You simply looking at the aspect ratio of a wing and trying to evaluate it based on comparing what kind of lines material it has on it isn't going to give you any sort of good indication of what that parachute flies like. Um the natural, right? We've all met the natural at the drop zone, right? He, he's, a, he's a great skydiver. He's a natural. Well, beware of that. You know, we all, there's some people here who may take a little bit more patient view of things and move forward, and there's other people that think, you know, they got it, right? They're a natural at this. They're a natural athlete. They're a natural skydiver, whatever. But we all have to have a certain level of respect for what we do and not get in over our head. Has anybody met the pilot? You run into people who, uh, if you're giving them advice on something, if you haven't met them yet, <clears throat> and they come to us under the tent sometimes, and they go, hey, uh, I'm thinking about getting a new parachute. I'm flying this. And uh, who knows here? Who, who knows how you can identify who a pilot is? Don't worry. You won't have to because they'll tell you. <laughs> they'll let you know, right? So... The, the knowledge that you get from being a pilot as far as understanding aerodynamics and the way wings fly and the way aerodynamics work is very useful and very valid in the sport of skydiving. But just simply being able to fly a fixed wing aircraft does not substitute for time under uh, a ram air canopy. So um, understanding and respecting that is important. I do other adventure sports, right? So your time and experience... I can see the people who've done canopy coaching. Brian Basher in the back is just cracking up right now. But um, people who do other adventure sports, you know, your experience in rock climbing or surfing or other things like that may make you a, a great skydiver, but they're not a substitute for good uh, canopy skills and time in the sport of skydiving. So they'll help, but they're not a substitute for. 
out of touch instructors. Um, we have some in our sport. Um, understand that sometimes they have a very narrow frame of reference. They might be from a small DZ. You know, they're you know if you ask them what the best parachute is, they may tell you it's a you know it's a saber because that's what was the best parachute. And I'm not referring to the saber two. They may love the original saber. And if you ask them about a stiletto, they'll tell you you don't want to buy one of them because they're way too high experience for anybody who has less than a thousand jumps. Well, the sport's evolved, and we have evolved as skydivers, and our level of education in the sport has has uh, has evolved too. So, what those parachutes meant to us 20 years ago is different than what they mean to us now. You know, uh, when the stiletto first came out, the level of experience and the types of skydiving we did were quite different. And maybe having less than 500 or 1,000 jumps probably wasn't a good idea on that wing. Nowadays, at a lighter wing loading, a stiletto can be very reasonable for somebody to jump, potentially, who has two, 300 skydives. So it really comes down to getting to know who that person is and what they want to do with it. Taking forums is gospel. Um, know that everybody in that forum has their own opinion about something. They're desires in the sport are different their frame of reference in the sport is different so whatever you read there for good or bad you know you may find people that say i think you should buy a pulse i think it's the best thing in the world you'll love it guaranteed go buy one and you go well that guy sounds pretty convincing sounds like he really likes his pulse maybe i'll go get one you know make take that as one piece of information on the other hand you might find somebody that goes don't ever buy a pulse i think they're horrible they're slow um they come in too flat, the riser pressure's too heavy, you don't want one of them, never buy one. Well, that guy, you know, they're talking about, the same, those two people are talking about the same exact parachute. One of them's telling you it's the best thing since sliced bread, and another thing's telling you don't go anywhere near it. So the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, depending on who you are. So don't take all that as gospel. High performance canopies. <clears throat> so... A lot of people ask about, you know, when when is it okay to buy a high performance wing? When is it okay to go to a? We'll talk more specifically about cross braces. So there's a lot of factors to consider, um, and we're gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about some at some point. Jump numbers might become a little bit less important than some other factors. So a lot of people come and say, "Oh, I can jump that. I've got 5,000 jumps." Okay, well, what have you done? You know, we talked about who is the user. What is what? It, what canopies have you jumped to get to that five thousand jumps? Um, if four thousand of those jumps are tandems, and another five hundred of them are military static lines on rounds, and then the other five hundred have been on sport ram air parachutes that are about, you know, you did twenty of them on a one ninety, twenty of them on a one seventy, you know, and you worked your way down. Now you're on a one thirty five, and you're ready for your cross brace hundred square foot parachute. Well, that's not the same as a guy who's maybe only has a thousand jumps, but he's worked his way up. He's spent a reasonable level of time on each wing. He's done some uh, canopy instruction with uh, Brian there in the back of the room, and he's taken a 101 course, and he's taken a 102 course, and he's worked his way up, and he's learned about canopy flight, does a lot of hop and pops, focuses time on education and learning about canopy flight. He might be a better candidate for one of those wings than the guy who has five times as many jumps as him. Uh, what's your the desired use of the canopy, and is the right size and model the right tool for the job? So I've run into AFF instructors who are as big as me, if not bigger. I ran into a guy in Cincinnati, and he was about my size, big burly guy, and he... He had the smallest parachute on the drop zone, and he was very proud of that. He jumped a velocity 75, and they had a huge landing area, and the wind blew towards the hangar, and uh, they ran jump run into the wind, and he, used, he did a, I watched him do AFF all day, and most of the instructors would come back and land right in front of the, you know, kind of right in front of the, the hangar packing area. And every day, all day I watched him land either at the far side of the landing area or in the middle of the landing area. Because when he was doing AFF jumps and he was last out of the aircraft, by the time he got open, he couldn't get any closer than halfway back to the landing area. And 
he was running every landing, and you'd watch him run and run and run and run and run, and he's trying to flare the canopy, and then it's collapsing behind him because he's jumping at this ridiculous wing loading that's way too high for what he's doing, doesn't have time to get back from the spots, and he, he had, quite frankly, the wrong tool for the job, you know? So think about is, it, is that small of a wing really what you need and what you want for what you're doing? What are your abilities? What's the user's abilities? Um, do you have the skill to be flying a wing like that? And then we talked about this, lower jump numbers, but highly focused canopy pilots. And we see that in some cases. Um, and understanding and evaluating the difference in those two, two situations. So in kind of closing, think... I I think what I kind of want everybody to think about is, is changing your mentality on some of what you look at in the sport. And it's great for us all to have goals in what we do in the sport. We all want to get somewhere, right? If you do four-way and you join a team, you set a goal for how many jumps you want to make, how much time you want to do in the tunnel, what you want your team dynamic to be. Do you have a goal of what you want your point average to be? Uh, if you're in canopy piloting, you may have a goal of, you know, what, you, what competitions you want to make it to and what kind of scores you want to put up. Uh, if you do crew and you do two-way, you might have a, an average, point average that you want to reach. But <clears throat> those are the, the short sprints in, this, in the sport that get us those type of things. Well, there's a lot of that in the sport, and a lot of people bring that type of sprint mentality into their canopy selection, right? So they're jumping a 190, and, you know, they need to know what it's going to take to get to a 170. And they, they need to know what it's going to take to to get to a 150. And then a 135. And now I need a 120. And that's a sprint. You know, you're trying to get somewhere. But once you get there, you're not going to be any more fulfilled than you were before. Just simply getting to a certain size or design a parachute that holds a certain level of prestige in your mind or in the, the community's mind isn't going to change that. So... The, the people who get ahead and enjoy the sport think of it more as a marathon. You know, they're in it for the long haul. And, you know, the idea that the way you get good in this sport is not, is not by reaching those goals, but it's by continuing to skydive. And uh, if any of you guys watch the PD Facebook page, there was um, a video that went up on Tuesday, and it was uh, a guy named Sandy Grillet, who's a pretty well-known skydiver in the U.S. He's a big way organizer, um, organizes RW jumps, does four-way, all kinds of stuff like that. And he, he said that if you're in the sport long enough and you survive this sport long enough, eventually you're probably going to get really good at it. You know, and it, it sounds kind of simple, but it's the truth, you know. So... The people who last in the sport are the ones who learn to enjoy the journey of skydiving and spend the time in the sport and really enjoy it. So it's not a race to get to a certain size. It's not a race to get to a certain design in a parachute. Enjoy the journey. Learn the parachutes all along the way. A um, uh, guy who used to work for us, his name's Jimmy Tranter. He now lives out in Colorado. Uh, he, was, he started skydiving when he was extremely young. Probably, in my opinion, one of the best canopy pilots in the world. And most people probably don't know him. But he is one of the most intuitive and smartest parachute flyers in the world. He jumps on the um, Denver Broncos Thunderstorm team that jumps into the Denver Broncos Stadium for every game now. Uh, he's a coach for Flight One. And if you ever, when I talk to him about his canopy progression, He'll talk about the sizes of canopies he used to jump. And having that discussion with him, he go, yeah, you know, and he, he was involved in test jumping the stiletto years ago, and, and uh, he jumped and he'd go, yeah, I put you know, 500 jumps on my Sabre 150. And he's a small, small guy, really small guy. Put 500 jumps on the Sabre 150, and I was kind of comfortable with that. And then I got a stiletto 135, and he said, after I put about eight or 900 jumps on that canopy, I, I kind of felt like I was starting to uncover and, and see what that canopy could do. <coughs> now, who in this room has put eight or 900 jumps on one model of 
have one canopy in their progression. Two, pe three people will raise their hand. So, it's a frame of reference. So, that's about learning the parachute. Um, it's pretty tough to discover everything a certain design or size can do in 20 jumps. So, think about the journey and enjoying the parachute. And um, that's what I've got for today. So, thank you guys all for listening. I hope you learned something. And uh, I guess I'll open the room up for questions now if you guys have anything. Thoughts, questions, opinions, good, bad, and different. Yeah, I've got right. one. Yeah. Um, where do you see that? Sorry, the silhouette model. Okay, so in this slide, I compared um, two models. I compared the Pulse and the Saber II. Um, and I can get it, if you guys want to at any point discuss any other specific models, stop by the the booth and we'll talk about like Katana, Stiletto, Velocity, Valkyrie, any of those. The Silhouette specifically, um, it's, we kind of break the products into two, kind of two paths, two different paths. We've got some of the canopies that take a, a more steeper type approach like the Sabre 2 and the Katana. And then we have some that take a flatter approach like the Pulse, Stiletto. And I would put the Silhouette kind of in that line. The same neighborhood as the Pulse. Um, a lot of the things that someone would look for in a pulse or in a silhouette, they'll find in the other one. So the pulse has some things that the silhouette doesn't do and vice versa. Um, I would almost put those two right next to each other as far as where they go in a, in a canopy progression if you're looking at a flat gliding, um, medium, medium to lower performing wing, probably at a slightly lighter loading. Um, the... So uh, we probably see a bit more of those in the larger sizes. Uh, it's a very popular wing for, and I hate to pigeonhole people by age, but there is a group of older jumpers in this in the in the sport that just love the silhouette. Um, and once they get a hold of it and they jump it, they go, "This is great! You know, why didn't I find this thing sooner?" Um, it's flat. It's easy. It lands pretty pretty simple. Um, it is <clears throat> what we refer to as the, how do I say this, um, has the highest customer satisfaction rate of any parachute we have. We receive the least complaints about the silhouette than any other canopy we get. And that's not because it's necessarily the best parachute we make, but people don't buy that parachute because of vanity. People don't buy it because it's the most popular wing that is out there. People don't rave about it the way they rave about a Sabre 2. But the people that buy a Silhouette usually buy it because they've talked to somebody who has similar, is a similar type user that, that, than they are, um, has similar desires and what they want out of a canopy, and they love it. So then they try it and they, they end up buying it. And if you get the right person under that canopy that wants the flat wing, easy openings, uh, comfortable flight, and they're not looking for a super hot sport rod, then they're the happiest people, happiest, some of the happiest customers we have. So not the, not the most popular wing, not what all the cool kids are looking for, but really makes people happy. Um, well, that's a, that's a good question because it comes up quite frequently. And um, there's, there's some canopies that have shorter control ranges on them. There's some that have longer control ranges on them. Uh, canopies like the Storm have a really long control range. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I would eliminate that canopy from your selection because you're a person who has shorter arms. Um, the first thing usually that I look at when someone has shorter arms is is look at the whole setup of the components. How are your brake lines set up? How long are the risers that you have? We frequently see people that are really short who have 15 inch risers on their rig and they can reach well above the risers, but 
for every inch you shorten the risers, you also lengthen the, the uh, distance you have to go with your arms in order to get a comparable um, flare. So that's something to consider as well. Um, I wouldn't say there's one parachute that's best for it. There's some that do have quicker and shorter responses than others. Um, in some cases, you have the option of maybe shortening the brake slightly, but it's something you're going to want to do very carefully with, with uh, some advice from someone who understands that model and that design. Um, because if you do that incorrectly, you can actually cause the exact opposite problem to have. If you get the canopy and brakes when it's coming in, then you're going to have a really difficult time landing it. Um, the other good thing to do is really uh, either seek seek advice from a canopy coach or at a minimum have somebody video a landing and get a really good understanding of what you're doing and how that's working how that's working so um, whether it's a person who is of shorter stature has shorter arms shorter build uh, there's a lot of things you can discover by seeing your landing and seeing what you're doing seeing what you're doing well seeing what you're doing poorly there's a lot of people who come in and have a tough time landing and they realize they've got I call them spaghetti arms like they come in with their hands like this with four inches of input into the brakes and a lot of the time when you do that you're taking a lot of the forward drive and speed you're taking a lot of the speed out of the canopy coming in for landing um, so there's a lot of things you can you can discover by by looking at video or getting uh, getting advice from someone who who can help you with that too but if you want to talk specifically about your situation come come chat with me after and we can discuss it yep other questions thoughts Cool. I think that's our time for today. So thanks, everybody, for coming. appreciate it. I hope you guys learned something.